uh, welcome. Um, my name's John, this is Ragnar. Um, today we're going to be uh, taking you through our explora explorations of a uh, legacy closure code base. So just to give you a quick, uh, quick flavour of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so this talk will be about legacy, legacy code, so um, we're going to give you some of our thoughts on, on what legacy code is, what that phrase means. Um, we'll talk about how, uh, why uh, we at U-Switch, why Ragnar and myself uh, have to work with legacy code. Um, we'll talk about why perhaps legacy code is, is desirable to some extent, controversially. Um, we'll look at what, we, what the legacy code we deal with looks like. Uh, we'll do some explorations. This is, the, this is the code bit, so if you're looking for, for code samples, you might have to wait a little bit, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll hopefully give you some advice on, on how we feel you can make working with legacy closure that much easier. So, uh, so before we begin, we, we better give a, a definition of, of uh, what legacy code is. Um, if you've been to uh, closure talks before, uh, you might know that it's customary to dive into the dictionary before you really begin anything. Um, so we had a look at, at legacy. Um, and legacy has two conflicting definitions, it feels to me. Um, so so the, there's this sort of two definitions of in the first category, um, legacy to the, the, the layman, the non-technical, sci uh, non-computer scientist, means uh, a gift by will, especially of money or personal property. It's, it's something that's, that's handed down, um, and it's, it's something that's got a, a value attached to it. It's something that, that you would, you would um, appreciate receiving, I think. Um, another definition is it's something handed down from, from an ancestor or a predecessor from the past. Um, again, it has some cultural significance, um, it's, it's something that, that someone has, has worked hard and they've thought of you in a positive way to, to pass this down to you. So I think that's quite interesting. Uh, interestingly, the, as well, the, the root of legacy uh, is from Middle English. Uh, legacy was the office of the deputy. Um, that itself is derived from Latin legatus or legate. Uh, the legate was the uh, equivalent of a major general in, uh, in the Roman army. Um, and that was a position of, of real authority. That was, it, was, it wasn't a term that was thrown around uh, with any sort of uh, malice, or, or it, it wasn't used in the same, term that we, the same tone that we use it today, um, had a, a huge amount of respect associated with it. So the third def definition I put up here is probably the definition we're all more familiar with, uh, this, this idea that, that legacy is, is pertaining to older outdated computer hardware, software, or data, whilst the functional does not work with, with up-to-date systems. Um, and really, I'd, I'd like to try and take the opportunity today to reclaim the, the first sort of definition, this, this sort of idea that, that a legacy is, is a positive thing that someone has, has worked hard on, they've solved a problem. Um, no one sets out to write legacy code. I would say that, that people try and solve the problems in the best way that they can with the tools they have at hand. Um, and so, so I think you should always try and, and learn and, and look at legacy in, in a very positive light. So, so moving on to the question of, of why do we at U-Switch have legacy codes? Um, I guess you could rephrase that as to how do we already have legacy closure? The language is, is pretty new, um, and in, in quite a short space of time, we've, we, we have built up a, a, a legacy closure code base. So I think uh, to, to explain this, we need to give you a little bit of, ba bit of background. So as I've said, uh, myself and Ragnar work for, for uswitch.com. I've been there for about, about six years. Ragnar's much newer, so hopefully we'll be able to give you two perspectives on, on the code we've, we've worked with. So uswitch.com is a, a UK-based price comparison website that some of you may have heard of. Um, this, is, this is what we look like. We allow consumers to compare home utilities, gas and electricity, uh, personal finance products, insurance products, uh, and we allow people to make a, a fair and uh, unbiased comparison um, across those and potentially switch to them. So to give you an idea of the sort of scale we're working at, uh, we have approximately 4 million UVs per month. We currently have 45 Clojure projects in production, so these are projects that GitHub has, has classed the major language in use as Clojure, uh, not just scripts or anything. Um, and we've got considerably more than 50,000 lines of closure code in production. That's just a, just a quick word count on sort of the, the top five applications that I work with. So it's probably something like 100, 150,000 lines of, of code in production. So to give you an idea of, of, of how we got here today, um, uh, so I'm not going to give you a talk today on, on how to sneak closure into your organization. This is not one of those, uh, you know, how, how, to get, how to get working with closure. Um, if you are interested in that, uh, Ryan, my colleague, who's sitting in the third row here, it's done a great talk at Skills Matter. Uh, if you search for Ryan Greenhall, it will come up. Um, so I'll talk to you today about how, how Clojure itself has sort of changed our, our thinking in, in a medium-sized organization over the long term. So uh, a few years ago, we were looking to, to rewrite some of our, our, our code. We had a sort of a creaking code base, uh, and we, you know, it was a perfect, uh, perfect target to, to rewrite. Uh, one of the main parts of our, our energy comparison 
is something we call the comparison service. It's sort of the fundamental core of performing an energy comparison for a customer. So um, the sort of data that this has to deal with, uh, a customer will come to our website and they will enter something along the lines of, I spend 50 pounds a month with British Gas online fixed electricity. It's a pretty standard customer query. We then need to work out uh, how much energy that equates to, and then we need to compare that against all the other plans on the market. So that's, that's a reasonably complicated calculation with a number of steps. The first thing we would do is subtract VAT at 5%. The next thing is we would work out, based on the tiered rates of that plan, how much energy that equates to. So these are just toy numbers. The real numbers are considerably more complicated than this. But um, that plan has 25 pence per kilowatt hour for only the first 1,000 kilowatt hours, and then 15 pence per kilowatt hour afterwards. Um, obviously, then there's discounts to apply on top. So I think you can see this is, again, it's, it's a reasonably com complicated calculation. We, we take some, some money off, up to a maximum of £10 per year. Ultimately, you end up with 3,177 kilowatt hours. So this is a, a series of transformations and computations on a, a set of input data um, with, with some nice, clearly defined calculations going on throughout. So once we've got that, that 3,177, we then need to fire that through every plan that's currently available to that customer on the market. So there could be tens or hundreds of plans available, um, and produce a, a table like this, which is the results that the customer could switch to. Uh, this needs to happen in milliseconds, because obviously the customer is waiting for this, this data to come back. Um, it needs to happen at reasonably high concurrency, so we're talking a number of requests per second. Uh, and that's, that's, to be honest, that, that whole process just feels like a perfect fit for functional programming. It's a, it's a complex data transformation, again, with, with some simple calculations at each step. It seemed like, again, uh, FP closure in particular uh, would work really well with that. So, um, so a few years ago, we, we had a, a bunch of developers who just uh, fancied having a go. They did play with closure a bit in their spare time. They said, we're going to have a go at rewriting this in closure. Um, and here's the initial commit from our oldest closure production service. It was rewritten a couple of times. So uh, this, is, this is the oldest one that's still in production. Uh, this is in 2010. So it's about three and a half years old now. Oh, just over three years. Um, so Mike Jones there, our, who's uh, moved on to bigger and better things now, he's now our CTO, uh, went off with, with a, a team of people and he decided, um, I'm going to rewrite this, this closure code base. Um, again, play with it in, in the spare time. Um, and uh, since then, well, it went into production pretty shortly after this, actually. It was a, a couple of weeks after this. Um, and since then, we've, we've built a suite of an ecosystem of closure applications which power the entire back end of U-Switch. So... To give you an idea of, of uh, Mike's legacy, uh, he's obviously, as I said, he's moved on to bigger and better things, and we've sort of come in and, and we work on his code base. The energy market has changed significantly in three and a half years, so we are still continuing updating uh, and working with this. Um, and the, the U-Switch Energy Back Office, which uh, again was originally Mike and a couple of friends, has grown, and there's been about 12 developers have worked on, on that code base over the last three, three and a half years. But at any one time, there's only actually been a maximum of three working on it. So again, there's been a huge amount of change, new people coming in, people looking at the code base. Um, and that in itself causes, causes problems. Um, again, to give you a bit of, bit, of, uh, bit of an idea of the sort of other applications that we're working with, um, the U-Switch customer journey, the switch life cycle, if, if you will, uh, of, of a switch. It, as a customer comes to the website, they can transact. Then that's sent over to the back office. Everything past that dividing line in the back office there is held by closure applications. So we have um, all of the, the transformations which send that data across to the UK energy suppliers. We have various analytics, automated P&Ls. So uh, again, we have, we have quite a suite, an ecosystem of closure. But um, in order to get there, we, again, we, ha we have had to work with these, these older legacy code bases, for better or for worse. So how have we built these effective closure teams who work with this code? Or, like, how does anyone build an effective team around a language. And I'd say that, that you shouldn't. It's a terrible idea. Um, you don't want a team of, of specialists, really. You, you want polyglot programmers who can interact with one another. And you want your teams to be built around problems. Um, we have a, a front-end team, um, but they, they have to know a bit of closure because often they have to interact with our services and they have to change stuff behind the scenes and, and vice versa. We're expected to, to make changes where we see fit. So, so we've organized our teams as far as possible around problems and told our developers, uh, use whatever tool you feel is, is appropriate for the task at hand. And for a number of tasks, particularly in the back office where I work, closure and functional programming in general are, are a really good fit. So when we've been building these teams, I think we've, we've identified sort of three clear phases of, of development those teams have gone through. 
which I'm going to talk to you about now and hopefully give you an insight, as I say, as to what we mean by legacy, how we've got, how we've got this legacy in, uh, in concrete detail. So the early group of, of developers, the pioneers, who came in and, uh, again, they've been playing with Clojure in their spare time, they, and they found a, a perfect application for it. This is uh, uh, Mike Jones and, and, his, and his colleagues. And they, they really were, were trailblazers. They, they'd come in and they'd, uh, they'd found a, a, a perfect fit for a tool they'd played with, and they, they had this passion, this spark, to invigorate others around them to, to, to adopt it. Um, the difficulty with those pioneers is that, is that you do need to be this catalyst, this spark for the rest of your team. Um, Having, having enthusiasm for your own work is, is obviously important, but if you're not able to infect others around you with that enthusiasm and, and get them on board, you're going to be the only one working on that code base and you're going to end up with so many other pioneers uh, by the roadside somewhere. So, so you really do need to, um, do need to, to have that, sort of, that spark, that passion. Um, ultimately, you're spiking away, you're in a new language, you've never written it in production. I think we, we've all got some ideas of what that might do to the, the quality of the code you're writing. Um, but I think, I think garbage is overstating it a little bit. It's, it's not that bad. I mean, you, if you're able to solve the problem, as, as Mike and his colleagues did, um, if, if the solution is, is working, then I think there's definitely something you can take away from that as, as a developer coming and looking at that code base uh, a few years on. But this is, to an extent, where the legacy code comes from. It's someone who's inexperienced or, or perhaps a language which is not really developed idioms, um, who, is, who is solving a problem, perhaps they don't know the, the, the space of the language or the, the core libraries, um, and the code they write, in some cases, is not the code that, that we would write today a few years on with, with that experience. But at the time, there was, there was no code to, to compare against, there was, there was no solution to compare against, and that, that means that the solution they produced, it was, it was the best they could do. So, to an extent, you know, legacy code can be, can be a good thing. Um, to, to mix my metaphors a little bit, uh, we want to be that guy who's you know, cruising along the Autobahn, 160 miles an hour on a slick roads, no potholes. You know, it, it's the same for our, our coding. We want you know, no obstacles. We want uh, to just be able to get on and solve the problems at hand and not, not worry about the croft. But ultimately, to get this, this beautiful, smooth, clean road, someone has to have dug that furrow. Someone has to have to pioneered out the way. And, and you know, this is the, actually probably the more difficult task, this, this, this trailblazing way, because this is all about getting from A to B. This is not about you know, the, the smoothness of the journey. And all we can hope to do is, is kind of build on top of that, that legacy that they've left behind, and produce a, a good solution. So to give you some, some uh, again, to go back over, over what we were talking about, and to give you some like, sort of thoughts on, on how we feel that, that pioneers can, can really drive forward a, a, a good a code base and, and get new stuff uh, uh, accepted by, by their peers, I mean, obviously, as I've said, it's important to be a catalyst. There is a tremendous amount of hard work involved. Um, we've, you know, you're doing something that, that you've, you've found you passionately enjoyed and perhaps you know, your colleagues haven't, haven't played with. You need to get them aboard. You need to work through together on structure interpretation of computer programs or, or Project Euler or something like that to try and solve uh, problems and, and get to grips with, with the language and the libraries. We found uh, rewriting existing applications as uh, an essential learning tool. Um, it's a, it's a really nice sort of problem space. You've got a very clearly defi defined problem. You've got some really, really good input and output boundaries, very clearly defined data structures of, of what data in and out is going to look like. Um, additionally, it forces you to do some of the, the sort of less interesting stuff that you might not solve if you're just running through exercises or working through books, like logging and exception handling. That's sort of boring, uh, but essential, essentially important things which are sometimes quite difficult to get your head around. Um, and obviously, the REPL is, is a fantastic tool in Clojure, which we're going to talk about a little bit further uh, later on. Um, but yeah, just, just that ability to, to experiment with the, with the core libraries is, is really, really essential. So we had this, this early team of, of, of pioneers, as I've said. Um, after a, a period of time, there's kind of only two ways a, a pioneer can go. Uh, there's, the, there's the cowboy route, um, where you can you know, just, just head off and just carry on spiking out and ignoring stuff, I guess. Today, this is a modern cowboy. I don't, I don't know who this is. It's just a, it's a search for cowboy coder. So apologies if, if you know who this is. But uh, yeah, headphones on, uh, not talking to anyone, just, just hacking away, spiking away stuff, um, and not communicating perhaps with, with peers. Um, all the other ways is you can try and build communities. That's a heavily pixelated uh, image of a, an old west community. So yes, you, you've got to try and, um, as much as possible, the responsible thing to do is, is to bring people on board with you and, and try and. Uh, try and bring them up to speed, but, but at the same time, you know, you, you have been writing, essentially, 
legacy code for a period of time. And, and, and I think that, you know, all of us who've experimented with bringing a new language in are able to identify the areas of code that we feel uh, are not quite as good as you would, you'd want them to be. Um, when you're bringing new developers sort of along the journey with you, it's, it's very important to show them these, these areas. Don't hide them away and, or don't, don't not even mention them and expect those developers to be able to determine the good from the bad. Um, it's, it's very important. Again, you know, there's, there's this, uh, this egoless programming um, mentality I think, I think you do need to adopt when you're, when you're learning something new because you're going to make mistakes. And it's important that your peers don't adopt those mistakes thinking that they're the right way to do something because you've got that, that, that greater level of experience. Um, so another really essential thing when you're, when you're building these communities, you've already been working in the language, um, you need to have established the very, very the basic things like project structure. It's very important to know where to look for your, for your tests, for your deployment scripts. Um, if you've got a shared deployment script, again, that's, that's super useful. You can just get the thing up and running in production. Um, all that sort of, again, annoying peripheral stuff that perhaps you've, you've had to deal with, it's got in the way of, of learning the language. You don't want people you're then bringing along, building into your community to have to deal with as well. So if you can get that sort of stuff sorted early on, then, uh, then that's, that's incredibly useful. So we found that we built a few, uh, a few closure applications. We were getting some sort of traction from the community. We'd done a few talks. And suddenly people were interested in us, and we were able to go around and, and recruit some incredibly smart people, which, which, which was uh, dead useful. Um, we were able to import in some external skills, some people who'd done a bit of production closure. They were able to come in and shine a, shine a new light on our closure code base, which Ragnar's hopefully going to tell you about uh, shortly. Um, but I think, again, it's very important that if, if you do get in experienced developers who maybe ha have differing opinions to yours, Expose them to the things you're, not you're unclear about or you feel are wrong. Don't hide those things away. Don't be embarrassed about the code you wrote in the past. Uh, you do need to embrace your legacy. It's, it's very important to, to take the stuff that, that you've written in the past and try and learn from it. Um, if, if you're not writing legacy code, then you're not growing because it, you're standing still. The code you're writing today is going to be the code you're always writing. So you, it, it's very important to, to take this idea and embrace uh, your legacy and, and make sure that other developers who come in subsequently are able to, to, to help you and l to learn from it. So that brings us on to... Right, so as we've seen, um, sort of over the years we've had uh, quite a few number of developers working on our, on our code base. They've had uh, different backgrounds, they've had sort of different um, experiences, um, um, probably most OO, and they've all been at um, different stages of their uh, journey towards closure enlightenment. So um, one of the questions we had for this presentation was really uh, what can we learn from the legacy and how has our way of, of writing closure changed over time and maybe also how has our way of programming in general changed over time, uh, maybe influenced by closure. So we took a step back to reflect a little bit on this, uh, sort of myself and Thomas as the new joiners with a uh, hopefully a fresh pair of eyes on the, on the code base and John as a um, guy who's been along for the whole, whole journey. Um, and we had lots of thoughts and opinions and theories on sort of how, how we had evol evolved collectively. Um, but they would invariably be quite subjective um, and very prone to sort of confirmation bias. We would selectively remember uh, the bad things we did a long time ago or someone else did a long time ago. Um, and perhaps the good things we did yesterday or, or today rather than the ugly hack we just did. So um, when sort of thinking about, about this, we wanted to see if we could find ways of supporting our theories with more objective uh, facts. And luckily for us, closure being a Lisp um, means that the code is data. And for this purpose, it means it's really easy for us to obtain the source code as data because it, it already is essentially. And since we're also um, responsible programmers, we store our source code in a, some kind of version control, Git in our case. Uh, which is really then just a database of our code as data over time. So we should be able to really leverage this. We should be able to go back in time, run some analysis on our code, uh, some measurement, maybe visualize it, and do that at sort of different points in time, and compare our findings. And maybe that could help us to, to better understand what's actually been going on. And this led us to develop a tool we're calling Torch. Um, so Torch is a tool for analyzing and visualizing our closure code base, or really any closure code base. Um, it's powered by um, Codec and Datomic, uh, both created by Rich Hickey, um, the author of, clo of uh, Closure. 
So Datomic is a functional database. We won't say much more about that, but I think uh, if you're a functional programmer or interested in functional programming, you should be interested in this. Um, and Codec is a library that basically takes the object model provided by Git, so sort of commits, trees, blobs, that kind of stuff, and imports it into Datomic, so you can leverage all the sort of query capabilities and uh, sort of more advanced database functionality provided by Datomic. And it also sort of does some other clever stuff. Yeah, so we're going to have a quick look at um, what Torch looks like. Yeah, so this is a quick live demo. So uh, this, this is Torch. Uh, this is, uh, it's been run on one of our existing repositories. You can see the black lines at the bottom are our, our commits over time. So they, they range from uh, a few, uh, couple of years ago to, to more recently. Um, it's a very much a work in progress, so it, uh, it's going to be released quite soon. Uh, but some of the stuff is a bit broken. But uh, essentially, it allows us to visualize uh, how our code has changed over time. So, for, for example, if we look at how our use of symbols in the language have changed, if I click here. So this is an um, example of the, the most commonly used symbols uh, in our code base. Size represents the uh, frequency of use. You can see that, that over, over time it changes. Um, and hopefully we're going to use that to, to give you a flavor of how our code has changed. Right, so uh, what does our legacy closure look like? So let's have a look at some of our observations. And as John said, we're going to try to support them a little bit by using Torch when possible. So the first thing we, we sort of noticed, which is perhaps not surprising, is that um, the pioneers had a quite limited vocabulary. And uh, this is probably true for any language, even spoken ones. Like when you start out, you, you only know a subset of the vocabulary. And the more you use it, the more you learn about it, uh, or the more your sort of vocabulary grows. Um, but Clojure is, is quite simple at its core. It's got so 20 or so special forms or primitives and around 500 functions in the core library. So compared to, to many other languages, it's, it's still quite small, but um, obviously it still, still takes time to, to sort of grasp that. Um, but I think the important thing is the, you know, the more you know about the language, um, the more precisely you're able to express yourself and um, you're able to choose a, a function that's more appropriate for what you're actually doing, which in turn makes your job easier, uh, probably easier for other people to read afterwards as well. Uh, you may be able to, to choose a more performant function over a less performant one. So sort of knowing your, the, the core vocabulary is, is really important, I think, and especially knowing what's there and what's not. And one example that sort of stood out when we did some analysis, we just looked at our code base using Torch, was our usage of loop recur. So for, for those of you not familiar with Clojure, loop recur is, is really a, a primitive construct in Clojure, and it's the way you can do recursion um, without consuming stack space. Um, but let's have a look what it actually means. So this is a simple loop recur example, which I hope you can see. Um, so we're essentially saying, um, start out with i as zero and sum as zero. So we're specifying two bindings. Then in the loop body, we're saying, uh, if i is less than 10, um, then we're going to recur, meaning jump back to the loop form, essentially. And instead of using the initial values we supplied, we're going to supply two new values for those bindings. So we're saying when you recur, uh, the new value of i is going to be incremented, or whatever i was before, incremented by 1. And sum is going to be whatever sum was before, but adding i. Um, if i is less, uh, not less than 10, we're just going to return whatever sum currently is. So this is really just actually summing up all numbers from 1 to 9. So it's going to be 45. Uh, but it's using this quite primitive construct enclosure to do it. And there's, there's nothing wrong with loop recur. It's, it's, a, it's really an essential construct. But um, there are probably more sort of um, or higher level functions that much makes your job easier and much more clearly expresses the actual intent of this. So just for clarity, this is probably how you could write it if you were a bit more experienced with it or had a um, better knowledge of the core vocabulary. So you would say, just give me the range of numbers from one to nine in this case, so it's exclusive, and then reduce them with plus. So now for a real world example, this is actually taken from our comparison service. Um, and so the, the key function here is the, the third one, aggregate percent discounts, which does some kind of get some percent discounts in and then aggregates them in some way. I'm actually not entirely sure what it does. But it's supposed to sort of make you cringe a little bit. It's quite complicated. Um, 
it's not, it's not too bad, but there's a lot of stuff going on in the recur statement here. Really a lot of stuff. So John had a go at just providing this for the purpose of this talk, just to see with sort of the knowledge we have now and the, um, yeah, how, how would we write it today. And I think the key thing is not that it's just shorter. Um, I think the key thing is that we're using sort of high level functions like for and group by, which uh, not only makes our job easier, as I said before, but also much, much more clearly um, shows what the actual intent was. So it makes it easier for other people to understand as well. Um, we're going to have a look at a Torch demo uh, pre-recorded that just shows you um, for the comparison service product that John mentioned how our usage of low precur has changed over time. So sort of in the beginning, you can see loop has a pretty big sort of um, space, so it's, it's used quite frequently. And, um, and remember, the, the commit timeline here is actually three years, so each sort of step is quite a long time. But as time goes by, it sort of shrinks away a little bit and eventually disappears entirely and we start to see more sort of typical uh, functional programming functions like map and uh, those kind of things. Okay, so closure being a Lisp, of course we need to talk a little bit about macros. Um, they're incredibly powerful um, and so powerful in fact I think that it's, it's quite easy to, to to go a little bit crazy with them when you first um, learn Clojure um, and sort of discover what's, what's possible. Um, and one of the things I noticed when I started was that this didn't, uh, didn't seem like this had happened at all at USwitch. We had almost no macros in, in any of our products, which I, I thought was a, a bit surprising uh, and a little bit interesting. Um, so to understand why this is, I think it's useful to take a look at why you would want macros in the first place. And I think this is uh, very uh, well expressed by a Guy Steele talk from 98, a keynote called The Growing a Language. Um, and one of the points he makes is that good programmers uh, build a working vocabulary. So they sort of devise a language of their own for the domain or for the problem they're, they're trying to solve. And uh, this is something Professor Wardler talked about yesterday as well, if, you, if you're there. And it, this is similar to this concept of a ubiquitous language. Um, and in order to do this, as a programmer, we need a language that can accommodate this kind of growth. And the growth can happen in two ways. Um, the first one is just you must be able to, to grow your vocabulary or the words of the language. Um, and that's something that's usually quite simple. You can add your own functions, you can add your own, own classes or methods, whatever your flavor is. Um, but the second thing, oh, sorry. The, uh, the second way language must be able to grow is that you must be able to change the actual rules of the language, so the grammar. And that's usually much harder, I'd say, in most languages. But in Lisps, it's, it's accomplished using macros. So I think the question then for us becomes, are we missing out in this case? Have we failed to grow a language that's um, helping us solve our problems? Are we sort of programming with closure in an inferior way? And uh, fortunately, I think the answer is no. <laughs> Uh, and the reason is that Clojure actually has a great vocabulary for programming with data. And this is something I think you hear all the time in the Clojure community. You know, we should be programming with data, we should be um, using simple functions or composing simple functions and applying them to, to our data to accomplish great things. And I just think uh, the kind of problems we're working with are very well sort of suited to this. So uh, that's probably why we haven't had to bend the language anymore. Saying that, oh, sorry. Saying that, we definitely use a lot of libraries uh, in Clojure that use macros quite extensi extensively, so we're definitely benefiting from the, their existence in the language. So we're going to have a quick look at one macro that we actually managed to dig out. Um, as you can see, it's called with FTPS, and it basically allows you to do a lot of stuff in the context of a connection to a uh, FTPS server. And I think the reason it became a macro uh, is because it's doing a lot of sort of funky Java interrupt stuff that you really don't want to know about. Um, so it, it's sort of a pretty clever little macro that hi hides away the ugly stuff and lets you focus on what you want to do. Um, so in this case, I think it's worked out well. But I think if we had had sort of lots of these small clever things in our code base, we would be in a quite different place. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk to you um, very briefly about, about organizing code in Clojure. Um, this is kind of a, a difficult area for me to, me to discuss because uh, I'm going to show you some ways that we did it wrong. I don't necessarily have the answers of how you should do it right because uh, I think it is it's a controversial, subjective um, study. So, so this is it's one of the less subjective bits of the, of the talk. Um, but essentially, several of us came to, to Clojure as our, our first functional language. Um, we come from an OO background. And I guess initially it was quite hard for us to get our head around the idea that, that namespaces are not classes, namespaces aren't, aren't objects, they're not groupings of behaviors. Um, so our opinion now is that, is that namespaces should be a grouping together of sim similar styles of functions on data, so similar types of transformations. Um, because you want your data flow through an application to be, be very transparent, you want to be able to, to see exactly how your, your map or vector is being transformed. You don't want to have to follow it through uh, bouncing back and forth between a number of different um, namespaces because that just adds a, a huge level of complexity. So it's giving you, you an idea of the sort of the, the smells that we're talking about here. Um, we've, we've got a couple of our older code bases have, have namespace declarations with, with just huge numbers of requires, um, which, which clearly indicate that there's, there's probably just a bit too much going on here. Um, there's, there's probably clever ways to, to sort of get around this. I mean, you could, you could require code dynamically, but, but that's really just, just hiding the symptom. I, th I think that this is just a, an example of a poor organization of, of, of our code base. And it's not a one-off either. Here's a different, um, a different uh, uh, namespace declaration with just a, a huge mess of, of requires going on. Um, so, I mean, namespace, it's, it's a really hard thing to, to give you advice about. Um, but uh, it's not necessarily a collection of things that do one thing. It's, it's, about, it's about the concepts that are being expressed in this, in this namespace. You, you want, again, transformations to be grouped together. Um, because otherwise, again, if your data is bouncing around, it just makes your life harder. So, to give you an idea of, of sort of how we've tried to visualize um, the sort of flow of data through our system uh, and the explosion of namespaces. We've got a couple of quick torch demos. So, so again, this is just, just, to, just to give you an idea of how you know, we started out quite innocently um, with our application here. Just you know, a few very, very simple uh, namespaces to covering the, the basic concepts of our application. Um, and again, we, we were fairly rigorous early on. I think that's, that's probably the, the key to it, is to make sure that you are rigorous you know, reviewing your code, because otherwise, Quite quickly, I'd say, the number of namespaces you have can, can explode out of control. Um, and then it becomes very, very difficult to, again, conceptualize exactly what's going on. Even with a tool like Torch, it becomes quite difficult to see what each of these things. I should say as well that the, the size of the bubble represents the, the volume of code uh, in each of those. Um, again, just as a sort of a, a more concrete example, perhaps, uh, with that huge number of, of namespaces there, if we view the dependencies between our namespaces using a different visualization, it's even harder to work out what's going on. I mean, this is very, very early on, one of the very early commits. Straight away, you know, we, some of these are obviously core libraries, but, but even so, just the, the web of dependencies between our, uh, our namespaces is, is very, very hard to unpick, again, even with a tool. And after only a, a very short space of time, and we were gonna pull in some more sort of testing namespaces here, but um, after a very short space of time, it's, it's impossible to see what's going on. I mean, it could just be because just Torch is, is you know, very early development. but um, to try and conceptualize that is it's almost impossible. So, so you've got to be very, very rigorous about maintaining clear channels of, of flow of data through your systems and not have this sort of web of dependencies. I mean, there's, there's a term that's sort of thrown around a lot, which is sort of spaghetti code, right? Like it's, you know, it's, it's something that, that we, we don't want. What we really want is this sort of tortellini code. It's very neat code that perhaps refer, transformations which refer to themselves uh, nicely encapsulated and have like very, very simple um, points of of, of ex exploration where, where data can come in and out. So um, additionally, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about code density, which is a, I don't know, it's a, a fairly meaningless phrase, but, but I, I wanted to talk about the, the fact that functional programming as, as a tool allows you to really express a, a huge number of concepts in a very short space of, a very short number of words, a very short number of characters. Um, the, the terseness of, of languages like Clojure really allow you to, to express an awful lot. Um, so as such, you, it's very, very simple to write, or very easy, I should say, to write um, incredibly dense functions, functions where a lot of stuff's going on. So this kind of leads us again to the slightly controversial subject of documentation. Um, I think this is, this is a very interesting uh, area to explore, particularly to sort of uh, understand that sort of the journey we've gone through from, from pioneers to, uh, to sort of later, more experienced closure developers. 
Um, so again, coming from a, an agile OO background, you know, we've, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in this room actually have, have been sort of strangled by documentation, um, you know, whether it's just excessive Java doc or you know, just doc documentation that's just plain wrong. Uh, documentation can really, really suffocate your project. Um, fundamentally as well, it's, it, there's a lot of work that needs to go into good documentation. It needs to keep up with your implementations. Um, so so we, we picked, we'd adopt a, adopted a number of very pragmatic solutions, um, which I think sort of general best practices, try to name our functions very clearly, uh, very clear indication of what they do. You can have variables or, or bindings very, very clear. But I think even so, it's, it's very easy to get yourself into a situation where you have a very short function that like we have here. Um, and I mean, transform vowels is a bit vague, but, but that does kind of express to an extent the intent of what's going on here. Um, I'm not sure if any of you can follow along. I, I certainly, when I first looked at this, didn't know what it was doing. Um, if you've done a bit of closure, you might know M is usually a map. Fun map is probably a map of funds. Um, but it's not really clear what's, what's going on in this function, even though it's only like four lines long or something. Um, a way of solving this would be add some documentation, add a doc string. Closure has support for doc strings, which, which pop up. Give you, uh, so this, this describes that what's going on here. Given a source map M and a, a map of keys of funds, fund map, return an updated M where each F, each fund in the fund map has been applied to the value of the same key in M. It's no clearer, I don't think. Um, it's, it's a poor doc string, to be fair, but I think good doc strings are incredibly hard to write, probably harder to write in the code. And again, there's still this, this complete lack of, uh, of, of mapping between what's actually the implementation and the documentation. Um, so when your code changes, if you forget to update the documentation, you're really going to mess up the next developer. So I guess this is, this is kind of the, the, what we were trying to do in, in sort of the consolidation communities phase of our, their development. But we, what we found now is this idea of executable documentation is, is a real killer feature. Um, so we, we try as much as possible to, to develop interactively uh, lots of, lots of um, back and forth between the REPL. And what we found is that by having clear examples of, of what your code does lots, littered around the place, perhaps in their own separate namespace, perhaps near the functions, um, it's very, very clear to see the intent of what's going on here. So, so just this, this small example in a comment form, which means it won't be evaluated. Um, you, can, you can execute this, and you can see exactly what happens. That, you know, given a map with A and B, the keys are 42 and 324, and a map of functions, functions are applied to the values in the map. I think that's, that's very clear, much clearer than a four-line doc string could be. Um, so, so I think, yeah, uh, executable documentation, it's, it's a killer feature, absolutely killer feature. Right, so we've seen uh, uh, sort of a couple of examples of a uh, legacy closure. Um, what are the ways we've found to sort of make it perhaps a bit easier to work with, with this kind of code? Um, so testing is always a contentious subject. Is that, a, is that the solution? Um, I think we found uh, that we have quite sort of, we basically have two applications that are extremely heavily tested, and these are our most critical ones, which makes sense. This is where we lose money where we're, if we're wrong or make people very disappointed. Um, but even in those applications, the testing we do s tend to be more sort of high level data in, data out, trying to use production data, feed it through our system, treating it like a black box, and then just verifying the stuff that comes out. And um, we've really done very, very little sort of unit testing, I'd say, of uh, individual functions. And a key reason for that, I think, is that the um, or one reason you would, or people sometimes use testing, is just to get an improved feedback cycle. Uh, but we found that that's just almost completely replaced by the interactive development uh, experience part of closure, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so just going to show a, a quick example, the torch again, um, of one of our more heavily tested projects. Um, and in the beginning, you can see, so the way you can do testing, there's a dev test form. You should use this one. Dev test is a way of defining a test. Uh, is is the way you do assertions in Clojure, or in the particular test framework we're using. And in the beginning, it's, you know, we have a couple of tests. It's, it's, not, it's not a big deal. But I think this product went into production sometime mid-2012. So this is in March. And suddenly, we get this explosion of, of tests where the sort of com completely dominating symbols are equals for all the assertions, and is as well. And, uh, Dev test has, has a pretty big space as well. So one thing I think the pioneers um, were also missing out on a little bit was uh, 
uh, the feedback you can have when programming with Clojure. And um, I think we're generally used to very poor feedback in our uh, programming languages. It's usually sort of compile and run, where run can be anything from just run it or you know, fire up the application and click through it to see what actually happened. Um, or you could use unit testing as a way of improving this feedback cycles. So you could just poke at certain pieces of your application, uh, maybe have tests running automatically in the background. Uh, but I'd still say it's a pretty poor feedback cycle, and it's sort of measured in perhaps minutes or in the best cases, um, uh, seconds. And it tends to also break your flow, so it sort of has this detachment from your development process. So we've really seen um, an increase in how we use the sort of interactive features provided by Clojure. Um, and I think this was a uh, sort of perhaps missed opportunity in the beginning, although it's, it's not easy to just directly get started with it. Um, so I think this is certainly something that's changed the way I think about the actual process of programming, um, and also more concretely how we tend to structure our programs in, in Clojure. And so, so in, interactive development, I think, is an idea that gets a lot of attention, a lot of praise, uh, but it's really ho hard to sort of figure out what people mean by it, especially if you haven't experienced it before. Um, and it's perhaps hard to, to understand what it would mean to your sort of day-to-day -day programming. Um, and one reason for that, I think, it's, is that it's often just equated with having a REPL, and where people view uh, a REPL as uh, just a console where you can enter stuff. So REPL stands for uh, read eval print loop. Uh, it essentially looks like this in Clojure. Um, or in most languages, it's some kind of prompt. You can enter an expression, it gets read, evaluated, and the result is printed to you. So in this case, we're trying some addition, we're trying to uh, concatenate two strings together to see what happens. And I think if you were sort of lured to closure by promises of a completely different uh, development experience, you're probably going to be a bit disappointed by this. Like, is this all there is to it? You know, we've seen, even at this conference, we've seen lots of examples of, of programming languages that have uh, similar abilities, I think. Um, but the fundamental, fundamental difference uh, with Clojure and, and Lisps in general, I think, is that they're really designed from, from the bottom up to work like this. So they're designed to receive um, small pieces of your program or small expressions or interactions, um, evaluate them or compile them uh, and incorporate them in your running program as you go along. So this really allows you to, you know, you can define a function in one instance and then try it out immediately on some input, change it if you didn't quite get it right. And I think the key is that not only is this possible, but it actually becomes or is the sort of primary way you can develop your, your closure applications. Um, and it also doesn't mean that you type stuff at a prompt all day, like a primitive sort of bash programmer or something like that. Uh, the, the REPL is more a mechanism that it enables this kind of um, uh, development. And we also noticed that there's been a sort of uh, couple of different stages we've gone through with this. So um, initially, for the pioneers, the, the REPL is just a great way of learning the language. It's, it's really at hand, it's easy to explore stuff or just try out new expressions, new functions, flip the arguments around to see what happens. So it's a really useful tool for, for learning. The second stage is sort of when you maybe come back to a code base you worked on a while ago or you coming to a new code base, it's a really valuable tool for exploring that code. So where you would perhaps in other languages sort of read page up and page down of code, trying to figure out what's going on, uh, maybe running some tests or writing out your own tests just to poke at certain pieces of your program. Uh, with Clojure, you can sort of just pick a function you're interested in uh, and immediately try it out on some input. And the third stage is where this kind of programming, I think, becomes the, the primary way you develop your program. So where working on your program or developing it actually means starting it up just as you would in production, but sort of connecting to it with a, with a repo and then just sort of incrementally changing it or uh, sort of molding it into what you want it to finally be. So this is an example function from a application that deals with loading a bunch of reports we get from different suppliers. And what often happens is that we get a report and they swap the columns around or sort of change something in a way that makes our system fail. 
And in that case, it's really useful to be able to go to a function that's sort of in the beginning. So this is a really long process of you know, reading a report, figuring out what's in it, uh, maybe running stuff to a database, doing some transformations. Um, but it's really useful to be able to just pick a function that's maybe sort of in the beginning of this process, run it on the actual file you received from the supplier with all the bad data in it, and just try it out and see what, what kind of data you get. So it's, it's, really, it's really great for that kind of thing as well. Um, so another thing we, we, found, we started doing is, is actually having sort of entire namespaces dedicated just to interactive development, just to aid you when you're uh, working in the REPL or, um, and so on. So this is an example function. It's a really simple function, but uh, in some cases you want to import some data for, for a given month to do some analysis on it. And uh, this just makes it really easy to do it from the REPL. You can just say import this month, and it also times the operation so we know how long it took and print some useful stuff. I don't know if you're going to have to skip that one, actually. Oh, maybe not. So this is um, an example where I just want to show that it's not really about sitting at this sort of REPL prompt all day doing stuff. So I'm in a namespace here in the code. Um, I realize I need a function that gives me odd numbers. So I can just sort of, first of all, imagine if I had that function, what would it look like? So I want to say odd numbers. Give me the 10, or all odd numbers up to 10. Then I can start implementing the function. So I'm, say, I'm going to say, give me a range of numbers up to n, filter out the even ones, which is actually wrong. Um, I'm going to evaluate that function. It's immediately available to me in the program. Um, I can then sort of invo evoke the function call I um, imagined before. And I immediately see that this is not actually all numbers. This is all the even numbers. So I can just go back and change it, change the predicate, reevaluate it, and then uh, run it again and hopefully see the result I was expecting. So this is just to show that it's, uh, it's not about having this prompt where you sort of type stuff in a primitive way. It's more uh, it's a different interactive experience, I think. So that's pretty much all we've got time for. Um, so uh, just, just going to quickly summarize some of the, the key points we've made. Um, so we feel that, that you should be building your teams around, around problems and you should be empowering them wherever possible to, uh, to choose the right tools for, for the jobs at hand. Um, we found that functional programming is a great tool for a certain category of problems we have to solve, and we hope that our developers are empowered to just go away and, and, and pick those, those correct tools. Um, you need to be introspecting on your code often, and, and as a team often, um, to identify areas of code which you feel are perhaps not, not up to standard. You need to share those with the rest of your team, um, really, really flag those up, and uh, wherever possible, rewrite them. It's, it's a great learning experience. And you need, to be you need to embrace your legacy uh, as a team and, and, and as, as developers. We write code today that, that either it's going to get thrown away or it's going to become legacy. It's, it's one of the two things. Like um, the, only, the only way you're not writing legacy code is if you're not improving, as I've said. So, so it's, it's very, very important to embrace your legacy, share it with others, and, and fit, learn as much as possible from, from the code you've written. And ultimately, you need to be, need to be growing. And this is a continual process. This, this whole thing, you need to be constantly reevaluating yourself and, and looking at code that you feel is, is, not, is not standard, and wherever possible, learning from it. So thank you, that's, that's all we've got to say. Uh, any questions? I think we've got a quick bit of time, or a little bit over time, but are there any questions? Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.